my mother took me out of bed. I was asleep. And I was rather frightened at being wakened and started to cry. And my mother said, now you mustn't cry because you, I'm going to show you a wonderful thing. It's something that you'll never see again, so you must remember that you've seen it. How little did she know? And she held me up to the window, and I can remember this beautiful sky. It was May 1910, and Jean Lammy was looking out at Halley's Comet. Despite her mother's prediction, Jean would still be around for its return 76 years later. The intervening years would bring momentous changes, catastrophic events, precious pleasures too, which no one could have anticipated then. Land of Gortri, up on the foothills of Kotia. Gone are the old folk, the house stands deserted. No light in the windows, no welcome at the door. In my early days, the place was full of people full of youth. We had neighbours every side of us that we would play with and meet. We hurled hoops, we walked round the loch, we made our own fun. It was a poor community, but um, rich in everything except money. It was, uh, it was a lovely time, a lovely age. It was the right age to be alive. While George Sheridan's family were scraping an existence from their Fermanagh Hill farm, thousands of people were flooding into Ireland's biggest industrial city, Belfast, to find work in the booming linen and shipbuilding industries. At the turn of the century, the city's population had grown to a quarter of a million. Among that influx were the parents of Shankill Roadman, John Henning. My father came from Rich Hill in Armagh and my mother came from Hill Hall and Lisburn. And they came to Belfast to live in their early marriage. My father uh, was just a labourer. He could barely read or write. But my mother was a bit more Italian than him. She was uh, a mill worker in her day. There were 12 in the family, uh, but seven of them had lived. Five of them died in there their early years. At that particular time, children were dying all over the place. Malnutrition, in most cases, or uh, fevers and things like that. Because on the Shankill Road graveyard, at one time they were dying that fast, they were just wrapping them up in sheets and burying them. I was born in 87 Cavendish Street. It's off the Falls Road. At that time, there were lots of fields around. Some of the houses hadn't been built. And it was a very happy life because it was all music. And anyone who couldn't play an instrument had a gramophone, you know, with the large horn and the records. Let's have a song upon the gramophone that Billy Williams sings so grand. With his save a little one for me. Mummy was always for the, the very serious music, you know good music, the operas, and she was 35 years in the Philharmonic Society. And Daddy, he was more of the music hall style, which I got a lot of when I was young, going to all the theatres then, and we got great artists, you know, coming along. I must go home tonight. <laughs> I must go home. 
Soccer was already established as the working man's sport at the turn of the century. There was an all-Ireland league. Distillery was one of the top clubs who could attract players from mainland Britain. My father was at Air College studying and uh, he was playing for the college team. And at that time, quite a number of uh, Scotch players came across to Belfast to play. And the distillery got to know about them and he was signed on in the early 1900s. And my father always played a goalkeeper. He was recognised with having terrific hands. He could pick the ball up on the one hand and he could throw it from one end of the field to the other. My mother didn't go out to work and then my father was, was in, 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 in lodgings in the Grobner Road and that was, that was, how, they, that was how they met. They, they must have lived quite convenient to each other. I was born in the Presbyterian Manse, Strabane, in 1905, my father being the minister there for 50 years. And he came from uh, County Wexford. My mother came from Belfast. My brothers were 11 and 9 years older than myself, so that I was largely brought up as an only child because they went away to school at Campbell College in Belfast. And for ministers' sons in those days, uh, the fee for board and tuition at Campbell College was 13 pounds a term. I was born in New York City because my mother was American. My father, Shane Leslie, uh, the writer, they met at a dinner in uh, London and my mother said to her host, who on earth sat mad Irishman you put me next to at dinner? And within a year she was married to him. <laughs> Originally the estate here was about 53,000 acres. By the time the, the Land Act started to operate, 1905, about it, it had dwindled a certain amount. Dotted all around the country were little whitewashed and thatched cottages, and uh, I'd roam over the hills, uh, and they'd always ask you in for a chat. And uh, they were very cosy, very thick walls. Uh, each farmer had his own geese, chickens, pigs, goats, etc. You might make as much money of a flock of hens as a, as a lock of cows. And so we, we, had a, we had a little of everything. We, had, we kept two asses stabled. We had our stable, that's the stable, the remains of the old stable up there, where we kept two asses housed all winter. And uh, the asses did everything. We threw the turf on them, we put out the manure, the farm the yard manure all went out. But the end of the hay was a big day. You'd be waiting for a good day and the neighbours would come. You'd have it arranged. One man could dress the stack, another man could build the stack, and another man could pitch it and so on. And there'd be a bit of a keely that night when the hay would be in. When it was built, there would have been about 16 servants. Footmen wore dark blue uniforms, gold buttons, yellow waistcoats. Cook, kitchen maid, scullery maid, there'd have been three in the kitchen and then three or four housemaids uh, doing things around the house. It was easy to get because the village is near and they could come in. Uh, they usually slept here, but some came in for the, by the day. The under servants would be Catholic largely. The upper servants, the butler, housekeeper, um, uh, more likely Protestant. Wells, the butler, uh, uh, very pompous and austere. He'd turn me out of the kitchen if he found me down there. Uh, he'd report to my grandparents, Master Jack is in the kitchen, my lady. The house was small. It was uh, a kitchen, and uh, not awfully big, and a scullery, which now is the working kitchen, 
and it was small, and uh, an open yard with an outside toilet, and uh, two bedrooms up the stairs. The three sisters all went into the back room. Of course, this was over a year. They weren't all born at the one time, and you realise, uh, as we were getting reared, the boys were in the, the room, the same room as my father and mother, and they separated the room by a sheet across it. Everybody had a big family. Not as many as 12, mind you, but around the five or six or seven mark. Not like that. There was no birth control then. Five year plan. Harry Curry has spent all of his 100 years in Belfast, mainly in the Ormo Road, a select area, or so he was led to believe. Dr. Hogg was one of the local doctors there, and he had to go around the houses, and he told us, you were lucky. You live in the halfway street in Belfast. For he says, you have the mountain there right through, you know, the, I think it's the Black Mountains or something up there right through to take the gas works fumes away. So we believed them. <laughs> One noticed the poverty in Strabane in those days a lot. There was a workhouse and they wore a uniform, the inmates as they were called, white corduroy breeches and they were recognisable wherever they went. They used to do small jobs like delivering newspapers to houses, and so you saw them quite often. And uh, women who had uh, illegitimate children, as they were so called in those days, uh, they would take refuge if there was no other refuge for them in the workhouse. I ran about doing matty just for people. And uh, the biggest matches that I did was going to the pawn for people. Now, the pawn shop was the shop where they took in anything, shoes, boots, clothes, shirts, anything at all. My own father, he, he always called his suit an indigo suit. It went in Monday and came out in Friday. <laughs> and uh, you pawned it, and the, the, the neighbours around the state, uh, I had a, a list to go to. And every morning I went to them, and uh, every one of them had the same thing. Now, you wait till there's nobody looking before you go in. But you'd have been waiting all day because everybody was there, boys like myself doing managers for people that the, the money was scarce. I remember my first day at school, I was shy and I was backward and I was terrified. I thought there was that there was one boy and he was a bully and I saw him treating other lads and I kept very close to my sister who was older than me for the first three or four days at school. I was born with a cleft palate and a hair lip and when I started to go to school then I got bullied as they'd call it now. Uh, everybody made fun of me um, the way I spoke. Well, I couldn't say green right and I couldn't do anything. When I had a three or four year old, I had my operation and I made a good job, both of my lip and the mentoring. The school I went to was St Catherine's and I was very, very lucky there to meet a nun called Sister Mary Rose. Now, she was very musical. I don't know where she got it from because they told me that she entered the convent when she was 18. But she was full of music and plays and the theatre and everything. So when she got me, she held on to me like grim death. She more or less encouraged me in that. For instance, uh, if I wanted to miss a day at school because I was rehearsing for some concert, she would say, that's all right, oh, that's all right, my, you needn't come. There was a rector there that he thought he had discovered a genius and he used to he'd tell my mother, I live to see him a bishop because he had me cut out for holy orders and he used to call me the professor and the rest of the lads would call me the professor and they wouldn't play with me and I got such a disgust to this professorship that I just decided 
I wasn't going to be extra study mm. and I, I sort of reared up and refused to learn. Silly lad that I was, maybe, I don't know. I um, just had no ambition. I wanted to be a farmer and stay on in my costry where the meadows were green and where everything was all right. I had very poor eyesight, and there was no such thing then as glasses, as we call them. And uh, I was always brought down to the, the front of the class because they had a big blackboard then, and we had a slate and chalk, and I could hardly see the blackboard, never mind the writing, and uh, I was always punished, getting my hand. See, the master and them did it again, and he was a great shock. We had smart money, and hit you right in the point of the finger. I got quite a lot of them, and I got quite a lot of bullying for by. So I did, at school, school days weren't my best. People came in from the country, you see. They hadn't uh, the shops around the country the half an hour, and the, no such a thing as a supermarket. So you had to come into the city if you wanted to buy anything. You had beautiful shops that are not there now. The bank buildings, all the windows beautifully dressed. Anderson Macaulay's, Norman's, Robinson Cleaver's. All those shops were really beautiful. Rob's, Sinclair's, and you knew them all. And sometimes you walked through them even if you weren't buying anything, just to be in the lovely light. And, all. and then they had these, the way they put the money, which was rather interesting. You see, these wires were all over the shop and she would uh, take your money and she'd put it in this little round box. She'd put it up, it was pulled, and it went right up to two girls sitting <laughs> right up in the ceiling. They fixed it and then you got your money back. Well, as a child, that used to fascinate me. You know, everybody looked up at that. That was the style then. What made a great difference to this town then? Woolworths came to town and Nothing over sixpence was sold in the store. It was great to get a clockwork train set for sixpence. And you could get your cup of tea for a penny in it. And then there was the conversation lozenges. With a wee yarn on, you could slip to your wee lady in the class at school. It said, I love you, or I'll see you after. Oh, with lots of fashions. I mean, you, you had frills and you had bows and you had buttons and, you know, and, and the nice thing was you would never have a frock the same as the little girl next door. As long as I remember, there was a web of Lispelaw tweed kept in the house. Uh, we would, our blankets were Lispelaw blankets. But we would put so much wool for sale, so much into manufacturing. A dressmaker would come into our house and run up a pair of short pants for me when I was seven years of age, eight years of age, or until I was 12 years of age. She'd run up a wee coat for my sisters. It was very formal in that you had to dress for dinner every night. The, the butler would ring the dressing gong at half past seven, which meant you rushed up to your room. You'd probably been ten playing tennis and were rather uh, perspiring, uh, changed, had a bath, and you had to be punctual when the dinner gong went at eight. You assembled in the drawing room assembly, uh, and it was considered very bad form uh, if you were late for dinner. Uh, and then ladies for tea would often wear tea gowns, uh, a kind of long gown, green and gold, I remember my mother's w w were, uh, and then change again to put on a long dress for dinner. And so there was much more changing of clothes then. Mr. Padre Rafferty, he was a great teacher, as light as a feather, great dancer. And I went to him for Irish dancing. Now, just like that, when he discovered that I could sing, he got engagements for his pupils in picture houses. You see, the picture houses would have what you call a turn. The pictures would be shown, and then they would have a turn on. Quite good artists. He put me on doing my own songs that Mummy had taught me. Well, then his wife suggested that she dress me up as a coon. You see, you called them coons at that time that have a straw hat and a blouse and the long pants. I remember I sang in Dundalk, and I, I, all around, like, the different little towns would have a picture house, and you would get a week in the picture house. And I remember the fee was six pounds, 
And that was money then. What age were you? I was coming nine. And we used to run races, what we called around the square. That was a block of houses. And uh, there we say street to North Street and the square. And it would have been about a quarter of a mile around it. And uh, they'd have short races, which I never could win. And then they started to see who can stay the longest. You know, running on, everybody dropped out. So I was able to manage them, all right. So it must have been a nut yard runner in my day. You were always running? Always running, yeah. Even the run at the nose. They had a challenge match between Austin Villa and Distillery. Austin Villa had won the English Cup and Distillery had won the Irish Cup. The game was a draw to each and apparently my father had an outstanding game. And uh, as a result of that, Distillery transferred him to Everton in 1906. He only played about six games for, Liver for Everton and then he was transferred to Liverpool and he only played about six games for Liverpool. And then he decided then that he wanted to go back to Scotland. In the early 1900s, Belfast was one of the world's most important shipbuilding centres. The city looked on with pride as thousands of workers constructed the biggest and most luxurious vessel in history, the unsinkable Titanic. Little did they know they were witnessing the build-up to one of the century's great disasters. Mr. Fitzpatrick took me to the picture house, Clannard picture house, and all I can remember are the portholes, the flash the, right along, you see. I wasn't really interested, and then the big, huge funnel. But I saw that, and I can remember that, and I only remembered it when I heard that it had gone down. Some people in the, in, in the street had the newspaper early. I think it was a lady next door came and told Mummy about it. Some people crying. And the iceberg hit the vessel, you see, and then it was going down, and then all the children and the women were put into small boats which were lowered down, this was explained, and the men stayed. And then you heard about saying goodbye to each other. Even as a child, you realised that was a, saying goodbye to each other, and you knew they would never see each other again. The band, it didn't, they didn't go. They stayed on during their job. And they played Nearer My God to Thee. And one woman said when the, the, her little, the little boat went nearly a mile out, they could still hear the voices coming and the, the orchestra playing. Notwithstanding the devastating setback of 1912, this was an age of expanding horizons for those who could afford it. Ireland had plenty of shipping links with Britain and Europe and a far more extensive railway system than it has now. It took an hour and a half from Belfast to Glaslock and we had our own station until 1962 when the Great Northern Railway largely closed down. And the other side, it went through Enniskillen to Bandoran uh, and so you could get to the west coast in less than two hours. Very convenient. It was first, second and third class with pink, brown and green tickets, I remember. And a waitress would come by and give you tea if you wanted it. So it was very relaxing. There were holiday opportunities for those without money too. My mother uh, was getting us ready one Friday night. And you got to make ten baths then. I was watching my sister and I. And an aunt came in and she said, oh, Maggie, what's wrong at night? You're getting them bath so early. Well, it's usually a Saturday night to get your wash. She says, I'm going to the uh, Governor Hall trip tomorrow. And he said, I'm getting them ready for it. And we shoes, say, we white mutton dummies, you know. Oh, she said, Maggie, you wouldn't let them go that, would you? She said, why? She said, you know, the barn goes out in front of the Governor Hall barn. with a big military barn then. They go out in front of them, and there's two men carried a big banner, and it says on it, the western strays of Belfast, free trip to Newcastle. So that finished that. My mother was very independent, so we then get going to the trip. One of the earliest holidays that I remember was going with my parents uh, to visit an uncle and aunt and their family in Hamburg. It was, it must have been about two years before they 
the First World War, about 1912. And why that is memorable is that I saw one of the first Zeppelins over the city. And uh, my cousins were at school at the time, and when they came back in the afternoon, they told us that there was great excitement, of course, in the school, and that the teacher had then told them that every time a Zeppelin passed, from that on, they were to stand at attention. And that caused my uncle and aunt to have a great discussion about the militarism of the Germans at that time and how they could see that the great preparations were being made for war. Most people in Ireland knew little and cared less about events in far off Germany. They were preoccupied with politics at home. It was the era of bitter debate on the Home Rule Bill, an issue that split communities, even families. My father joined what were known as the Home Rulers at that time in favour of that bill because he thought that if Ireland had the status of a dominion with a, with a parliament in Dublin, perhaps it would solve the Irish question. Sir Edward Carson, later Lord Carson, fiercely opposed it. And he drew up a covenant and asked all people who agreed with him, the unionists, in other words, to sign it. You took the oath and you signed the covenant and it was on a lovely paper and uh, you were told to take it home and frame it and you've signed your loyalty, you've signed to be called up and you, you must go. No, no backsliding and all this kind of thing. So I took mine home and got it framed. <laughs> Do you know where it is now? <laughs> Some Protestants didn't sign it, but most did. And my father was one of those who didn't sign. Amongst that lot were other Presbyterian ministers. And some of them suffered great ostracism from their own congregations and had to go to, to America and, and uh, leave Ireland altogether. But my father was fortunate in living in Straban, a very tolerant, friendly town. My mother, on the other hand, came from Belfast, and she was a strong unionist. Well, as you can imagine, there used to be quite a lot of argument in my home. My father went to Cambridge, King's College, Cambridge, uh, about 1903 period, uh, and the Catholic chaplain, Monsignor Barnes, uh, had a great influence over him. He was a lifelong friend later, and uh, he really converted about that time. And then he became an Irish nationalist. It all hung together and wanted the revival of the Irish language. My grandfather wasn't uh, at all pleased being a very ultra-Protestant uh, family, uh, and uh, my grandmother was much more tolerant. Uh, being American, uh, she had wider views, I think. At that time, uh, the time of the signing of the Covenant, there were a lot of young men who joined the Ulster Volunteer Force, and they got involved in gun running and all that sort of thing. My brother was one who joined it. He was a very daredevil, adventurous lad. And he joined it much against my father's wishes. But I rather think my mother, with her unionist uh, tendencies and beliefs, was rather pleased. We each got a rifle home with us. And I called them a mauser, the rifles. Well, I wasn't much of a gunman then, but I passed a policeman and he just winked at me like that. <laughs> he didn't make any attempt like to take the gun, so the law must have been on their side, EVF side, current of Lord Carson, you see.
But instead of the armed conflict they were expecting at home, the UVF and many thousands of other Irishmen soon found themselves called up to defend Britain from Germany. We must have heard about it on the 5th of August, 1914. And we, as a family, we were all standing outside the post office in Darnings. We had just had a swim, and my father opened the newspaper and spread it out, and sadly said that war had been declared. In a few minutes, my eldest brother the one who had been in the volunteer force, said, I am going to Belfast tomorrow to enlist. Most UVF men joined the 36th Ulster Division and were shipped off to France and the nightmare of battlefields like the Somme where five and a half thousand Ulstermen died in the first two days of fighting. And there were many other battlefields. My father went to the Dardanelles, the Oxenbachs Regiment, and he had a nervous breakdown, actually, and he was invalided out. And so um, uh, he didn't have much war service, but his brother Norman was killed in October 1914 uh, in the Rifle Brigade uh, when at Armentier. My father was engaged in the first battle of Arras and uh, on New Year's Day 1917, early in the morning, the Germans started again with a heavy shelling and a big heavy German mortar shell landed on the dugout that my father was in along with four others and the five men in the dugout were killed. My father was actually writing a letter home whenever he was killed. It was a New Year's Day. My mother happened to be at home that morning. There were other people had received notices of the same kind that morning, and uh, the place was absolutely in panic. It was uh, real distressing. We had a baby brother of a year and nine months and uh, he died that same week as my father was killed. And that's one of the other things that always stays in my mind. Carrying the small coffin, myself and another gentleman who was a manager at the mine where my father worked. The Great War was claiming millions of lives and the demand for new volunteers was unrelenting. The 16th Irish Division of Nationalists from the Falls Road joined with us Ulster men and after knocking at each other to go away together to fight. United together, we landed at France. They weren't long there, they were withdrawn to go to Egypt, outside Malta. We got sunk, torpedoed, and there were 602 lost on the Oregon. And here I am here the day to tell the tale. And it makes me think many times how lucky, lucky I had been at 100 years of age. When my brother joined the, the army to begin with, he was in the Comet Rangers. And he then went into the Air Force. And he was brought down over a town in France called Ciswan and buried in the local cemetery there. It was a terrible blow to my family, especially as my younger brother also died. He had gone into the Indian Army and so we lost the two of them within three years. After my father died, 
my mother had contact with her people at home in Belfast. And she decided then that when things got settled down, we would return to Belfast. With the war over, Ireland was back to its usual preoccupation, politics and the growing possibility of partition. James Craig had assumed the mantle of the Unionist leadership. Among nationalists, Eamon de Valera, a hero of the 1916 Easter Rebellion in Dublin, was one of two emerging leaders. The other was pin-up idol Michael Collins. Michael Collins was a great hero. And he was good looking, you see, and in the uniform. Everyone loved him and talked about him. And then there were photographs. You could buy postcards, you see. My father admired Michael Collins very much. And they all used to meet at Sir John and Lady Lavery's house in London. It's always said uh, Michael Collins was in love with Hazel Lavery, a great beauty. Uh, that probably was so to some extent. And they used to meet and have discussions there. And it was a sort of a happy atmosphere, because Lady Lavery being American uh, and my father's, uh, my mother American, it, it made a kind of neutral atmosphere where, where they could discuss things very openly. Belfast was about to be the capital city of the new Northern Ireland state, with James Craig as its first prime minister. But where would the border be? It would be Roman Catholics, Protestants all sitting around Cayley and talking about maybe we'll be, uh, maybe the South Fermanagh would go into the Free State and maybe East Donegal will go into the North and this would be, I can remember hearing, it used to be a topic to be, for Swithern where we'll be, where we'd end up. My grandfather uh, was made Lord Lieutenant of County Monaghan when Monaghan, Donegal, and Cavan were to be in the uh, Northern uh, Irish group. Instead of six counties, there'd have been nine. And he got his expensive uniforms, sword and all. And two months later, the whole situation was changed. And so I don't think he even wore them. But I suppose he sold them once the uh, Monaghan was, was pushed into the Free State. The decision was taken in 1921. The boundaries were drawn, and down at Gortree and Fermanagh, George Sheridan found himself living on an international frontier. That ditch there became the border. It was a ditch that my father crossed three, four times a day, every day of his life. And it seemed ridiculous, you know, that when customs would come and say, you can't do this, and you can't do that. A woman come across with a basket of eggs, here was a customs police from Belcour ready to seize them. It's just a bit of a sod ditch that runs up the mountain. When the heather goes on fire, the ditch sometimes burns. It would burn for a week and it would burn away altogether. And you could nearly say, well, if you could burn away the whole border, that would be a great job. But it's, it's so insignificant, you know, and yet it's the border. Of course, that affected Straben enormously because Lifford and Straben are almost the same town just separated by the River Morn. And many of the Stuban people had businesses in Stuban and lived in Lifford, and still do, as a matter of fact. It just changed everybody's life. Our own customs was at the railway station here, so it was very convenient. We knew the customs officer and everything. And then uh, there were unapproved roads set up, so we couldn't motor across to Gallatin anymore. We had to go around by Middletown, or you had to go the other way through Ochnacloy, uh, and uh, it, that was an inconvenience. My father wanted all the road signs in Ireland to be in ancient Irish, and uh, so th that was done for a moment. Not because, well, they all did, the Irish government. Well, he went out for a drive and he lost his way immediately with some friends. <laughs> and so then they put them in Irish and English together, like now. We had to walk most of the night with the cattle to get to an Eskillen fair. It put great hardship on us. We used to toss a gap and drive them down to Black Lion Fair. And if we didn't sell them, we could turn them out and they'd 
make their way home because cattle that was reared on the farm would always make their way back. And it was so handy and so natural. The partition of Ireland sparked off a blaze of violence in Belfast, every bit as shocking as what was to follow 50 years later. The streets then were all cobbled stones, and uh, they were great ammunition because they were only built in the soil. And all you need was a knife or something to hook around, and then you had a good metal for firing. And there was a lot of looting, and in this particular one, with a big campaign like cut really on about. So this young one had about the same age as my son would call him Mordek. We got a knife each, and we started fancying me all the children do. The shooting and the, the shooting and all the throwing. Then the fact that we were behind the crowd. And then the army then had a, had a motor car, and it was a miniature tank, and they called it the Whippet. Had a turret and all in it. And people were hard scared of them because they'd just come round and open fire while they were screwed. Now this fight had been going on all night. So they got somebody shoot, here's the whippet. And everybody scattered. And uh, I scattered too. And I lived about, uh, about 100 yards from where it was happening up in the house. And uh, about 10 minutes after, 15 minutes after I was in the house, a rap came to the door. My mother answered it. Uh, says, Maggie, is your jaw in? She says, I'm sitting here. Oh, she says, thank God, because of the wee Billy Mordick, we, he was playing with him. Now the whip come around, he's blew the bits. The McMahon family, they were murdered. I can remember the shots that night. I mean, everybody was awake. People were down at their front door. People were off the bedroom windows. And we all heard the shots. I heard those as a child. Then the next day you heard the whole family up and killed the father and the boys. Having returned from Scotland, the young Donald Sloan was now living with his uncle, an orangeman, in a terraced row on the Falls Road. I was there for about two years in Mulholland Terrace and uh, uh, all of a sudden we were all brought down one evening and said, we've got to go. We've got 24 hours to get out by the IRA, and uh, that was a bit of a shock. So my uncle got temporary premises in Peckenham Street. Then the family decided that uh, we should go to Craigavan and live with uh, with my uncle there. Craigavan was very rural. There wasn't a building about it that there is now. I mean, as far as Sea Hill would be concerned, uh, there were no houses on the far side of the road at all, right down to the beach. You could walk across the field to the beach. And very, very little traffic. i give you an instance of it. I missed the last bus on a Sunday evening and had to walk from the Albert Bridge Road to Creek of Ad. Never passed a car the whole way. Dancing was the popular distraction from the hardships of the time. At Fruit Hill in West Belfast, May King, already a youthful veteran of the stage, was beginning to realise the potential of her dance training. I suppose I would have been about 16, or maybe going on for 17, and uh, I started to teach there. We sent little, we advertised, and we sent little pamphlets all around for the children. And I remember the first day, I've got 21 pupils, which was very nice. It was a guinea for 10 lessons. Later, May would move to a studio in the city centre, where her classes would continue for another 20 years. I went to school in Edinburgh and went on from there to get my degree in the university. My days at university were at a time which was a time when I think women were both um, both emancipated and safer than at any other time in history. During the war, women, of course, had, had to take men's places in munitions and in many other businesses when the men were at the front. And they certainly weren't going to go back and sit at home just waiting for husbands. 
some on it and watch me. And uh, he says, do you want to buy with you? I, I would take up run because he said there's the potential of being a runner. So from then on then I joined a club called Ultraville Harriers. And uh, with a junior cross country winning teams, I won six mile road races. But never was my mind to thinking of marathon run then. We went all right for a few years. And then the uncle that we were staying with in Craigavad decided to get married. And uh, we were put out of the house, told to leave. We knew where to go to, but we had to leave anyhow. And by some good fortune, the local postman, Edward Beale, heard about it. And uh, Edward came to us and said, you've got to come and stay with, uh, with us until you get a place. So my brother and sister and I and my mother had whatever two or three belongings we had and uh, went to stay with Edward and Mrs. Beale up the Ballamoney Road. All through the summer, people would come and spend uh, four or five days a week, perhaps ten days, and then they'd go and then another lot would come. All sorts of people like W.B. Yeats, the poet, uh, Sir John and Lady Lavery, uh, Prince Pierre of Monaco, and uh, Lady Randolph Churchill used to come a lot. Uh, there was tennis, there was ping pong, and uh, in the evening there'd be bridge, played after dinner. We had a house in London, Westbourne Terrace, Lancaster Gate, and we spent six months in London of each year, six months here. We always regarded Glasslock as home, and were always longing to get back here. Hated going back to London. I left school at 14, and uh, my father, he would, uh, I think of rather that I had went on to do something else, but I said, I want to be a farmer, so he said, right, oh, you'll start to work on Monday. So I took my spade on my shoulders, went to dig corn ground, and from that day on I worked all my life on the farm in Gortry. In part two of The Lives of Our Time, the wireless comes to the farthest corner of Fermanagh. John Leslie is taken prisoner of war. John Henning escapes the Germans and pursues an Olympic dream and there's much to learn about marriage and sex. Mm -hmm.